South Africa has recorded 151,209 confirmed COVID-19 cases. The death toll is now 2,657. More than 73,000 people have recovered from the virus. That sounds like good news, but is it? Some experts now believe survivors may suffer from long-term mental health and respiratory problems. For more on this, we're joined by the chairperson of the COVID-19 Ministerial Advisory Committee, Professor Salim Abdul Karim. A very good morning to you. Always good to have you on the show. Tell us what you know about the long-term impact. Yes, a very good morning. So we have originally, when we first heard about this coronavirus, it was thought to be similar to SARS, in other words, causing an acute respiratory illness. And initially, that's what we looked for. And as we began to understand the way in which this virus causes disease, we became clearer that in a proportion of patients, the virus moves beyond the nose and the back of the throat into the lungs. And in those patients where it enters the lungs and starts uh, replicating in the cells of the lungs, that in a small proportion of them, they get an overreaction of the immune system. It's something we call the cytokine storm that you see. When that happens, your entire body can become infected. Literally, this disease can cause a problem from head to toe. In your head, you can have, uh, it can lead to strokes, confusion, headaches. And in the toes, it has a unique uh, problem where the small vessels become inflamed and they bleed, causing these red blotches. It's called COVID toes. So we have a disease that can literally affect all parts of our body. And, we now, have, and we now have a better understanding that when you recover, and you're ready to go home from hospital, it takes a little while before your lungs can fully recover. So many of the patients need you know, weeks, if not months, to get their full lung function back because of the damage that's caused. And so we have to expect that uh, the full extent of this recovery will take quite a while. All right, some dis uh, disturbing developments in South Africa. I mean, we're hearing that at least 10 children between the age of you know, 0 to 20 have died in the country recently. And we always heard that kids were exempt from this or that they were immune to it or whatever the correct terminology is. What's happened there? So the data we have from most of the rest of the world is that children have a very mild condition. And in many of them, they don't even know they have the disease. And so when we began to see cases in South Africa, we were expecting to see a similar picture. It's not very clear whether all of these particular children that died when they had COVID died off COVID-19. Some, we know, actually had other comorbidities and uh, COVID may have complicated that. And so correctly, they have been labeled as uh, with COVID as a contributory condition. We do know that this disease can cause severe illness in children. That's been described. They were cases of Kawasaki disease, a sort of immune condition. But in many of those severe patients, these children with severe disease, most of them still recover. So this particular pattern that we're seeing in South Africa needs more close uh, investigation and interrogation before we categorically say that this is COVID-19. Okay, so again, that question of opening up schools, is it premature if we still need to undergo this very important investigation? Yeah, I think as we look at uh, what the profile, the clinical profile in patients is, we'll get more information. As it stands right now, these are very rare. And when you think about uh, the fact that we now are going to have to live with this vital threat, for many months, if not many years, we have to figure out a way in which we can get on with the important things that need to be done. And that includes going to school, going to work and so on, because this vital threat is not going anywhere anytime soon. So how we balance that becomes an issue. Mm. All right, let's talk a little bit about the report issued by the health minister and the sort of information that hospital admissions have given us. Talk us through how that will help biting 
uh, sorry, fighting the disease? So we look at three measures when we look at this disease in order to ensure that not any one of them is skewed. The first thing we look at is how many people are testing positive. And that's a key marker for us because it tells us how many people are newly acquiring the disease, especially because they are symptomatic. So that's one indicator. But on its own, it doesn't tell you the full story because you do want to know how many of those patients are getting admitted to hospital. And then among those, you want to know how many are dying. And so we look at all three measures. Hospitalizations, uh, the challenge we have is accurate reporting and the lag that occurs in the reporting. And the National Institute of Communicable Diseases has a sentinel program where they monitor this. And so they give us information, but it's not of all hospitals. And what has been emerging from that data has been very helpful. The first is that we are seeing a similar profile to what was described in the US and in China. And that is that older people have a much more severe form of the disease and our mortality rates are much higher in older people. The second is that we're seeing a profile of comorbidities. In other words, people who have other diseases at the same time. And the, the, the four key diseases are diabetes, uh, obesity, hypertension, and cancers. If you have those, you have an increased risk of having an adverse outcome and having a severe form of the disease. So we are learning that and getting a better sense of that. At the same time, this information also gives us an idea about how we are flattening the curve. Because flattening the curve is about trying to keep the number of cases within the limits that the hospitals can manage. And that's a challenge to do because we don't really control the number of infections. Uh, we, we can't control that, but we can control how many beds we have and we can control uh, you know, how much of services we can make available. And so that's what we focus on. Okay, and the successes of dexamethasone and high flow oxygen, I mean, is the use of both of those something that will prevent more people from dying? Absolutely. So uh, that has been quite an important uh, research that has been undertaken at, the, uh, at Cape Town University, where they looked at the potential value of high flow nasal cannula. Basically, it's, it's the, the challenge in this disease is that when the patients get a lung infection, they can't exchange oxygen that they're breathing into their bloodstream. So it's not a mechanical failure. It's not that they can't breathe. They can breathe, but the oxygen they breathe can't get into their lungs, into their bloodstream. So when you put this high flow of oxygen, which is a higher concentration and much more oxygen, it addresses that problem and saves having to put those patients onto ventilators. Because when you get onto ventilators, the mortality is quite high. And, and ventilators are really for mechanical failure. So high flow nasal cannula is clearly part of our strategy, as is helmet uh, provision of oxygen. So we, we, we now are learning from many parts of the world and from our own work that there are ways in which we can improve survival. Dexamethasone, the most recent data from the UK, from the researchers at Oxford University, from the recovery trial, provided us with the first drug that actually shows that we can make an impact on severe disease. And I want to be very clear, dexamethasone has no value in patients who do not have severe disease because it doesn't attack the virus. It suppresses our overactive immune response. And in those patients on oxygen, those patients on ventilators, severe form of overreaction of the immune system, dexamethasone can save about one third of those lives. And that's an important finding. All right, let's leave it on that positive.